morning, and uh, as we're going to the book of Matthew, I'm going to open up in prayer. Father God, we lift you up this morning. We thank you for your goodness, Lord. Father, we pray, Father, that you show yourself real to us this morning, that you speak to us through your word. Father, we thank you that our minds are alert, our hearts and our ears are open and receptive to the spirit of your living word, Lord. And Father, we just thank you right now for your word, and we give you all the glory and all the honor in the precious name of Jesus. And everyone says, amen, amen and amen. Let's go to the book of Matthew chapter uh, 4. And uh, we're going to be going to verse number 18. Matthew chapter 4, verse number uh, 18. This is what the Word shows us here. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. You know, it's interesting, as we are going to be looking a little bit further at Jesus this morning, going to select his disciples, his students. We've talked about discipleship in the past, but if you don't remember what the word disciple means, it means just that. It means to be a learner, uh, a student. And that's what Jesus was going to do. He was going to find those people that were wanting to follow him, to learn. And therefore, they're called disciples. Disciples of the Lord. Somebody who is learning and wants to be taught how to follow Jesus. So we should all, in essence, then be disciples of the Lord. Amen? Now, what you'll notice is that after Jesus went to the cross, when he was crucified, after he rose from the dead, he now told his disciples they were no longer students. They were now going to be apostles. And what the difference is between a, a disciple and an apostle is, is, as I mentioned, a disciple is one who's learning, a student. An apostle is one who's been selected to do a specific job for God. That's what an apostle is. An apostle does a specific job for God. And now they were no longer students, and it was time for them to go and get the job done after he left the earth. That's what he assigned them to do. But going back to talking about Jesus picking his disciples... If you study the scriptures, we find it very interesting that they say four to seven of the disciples out of the twelve were actually fishermen. Isn't that interesting? So we could say then that maybe more than half of the disciples were fishermen. Now, just remember that little point right there because, you know, when God shows us things in the Bible... He always likes to use analogies. He likes to use symbolism. He likes to give us a picture, right? They also use the, the terminology types and shadows. So when God shows us things in the Bible, more often in the Old Testament, it's something of a, a picture that's to come. So remember that little point, Jesus chose a lot of his guys that were fishermen, right? So we'll, we'll look at that a little bit later, but just wanted you to kind of, you know, make a mental note there that many of the disciples that Jesus chose were fishermen. Okay. So now as Jesus is going to pick his disciples, as we see here in Matthew 4, 18, right? He went and he called... Two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew. And they were in the process of what? They were working. They were fishing, casting their nets out there, for they were fishermen. And let's go to the Gospel of Mark, chapter uh, 16. Hold your place in Matthew. We'll be back there, but we're going to go to Mark 16. And that's right after Matthew here, the next book. Matthew, 
or I'm sorry, Mark chapter 1. It's the next book after Matthew. Mark chapter 1. We'll be going to verse 16. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Verse 17. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. When they had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother, his brother, who also were in the boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. Isn't that interesting? That as he went about choosing the, the twelve, we're seeing that they were going about their day-to-day business, their day-to-day activities, but yet when Jesus said, come follow me, they stopped everything that they were doing to go follow him. We don't see in any of the dialogue in the Gospels of them saying, oh, oh, oh but hold on, Jesus, I, <clears throat> I have to do this or I have to do that. We do see in one story in the Bible where somebody does mention to Jesus like, well, I got to go bury my, my father. And Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead, is what he told them. Was he being insensitive? No, he was not being insensitive. <clears throat> what you need to understand is that what Jesus was trying to basically say was, in not so many words, is that, you know, his father was already passed away. There's nothing you can do for him. And if you don't know, when we have a memorial service for a, a loved one who's passed away, it's not necessarily for the loved one. Yes, we call it a celebration of life or celebrating their life, but they're gone. They're with the Father. The memorial service is for us that are left behind so that we could move on, so that we could start the grieving process, so that we could, you know, go ahead and, you know, move forward. That's what the process is all about. And that's why Jesus was telling them, let the dead bury the dead. So this morning we're looking at discipleship, but we're going to look at it in a, a more deeper context this morning. I made a statement earlier that if we are truly a follower of Christ, then we are a disciple of Christ. Amen? Because we're students, we're learning uh, about Christ, and we want to follow Him. But the one thing this morning that I want to emphasize or look at this morning is that if we are truly a disciple of Christ, if we are really trying to follow Him, then that means that we should be fishers of men. Because a true disciple is a fisher of men. We'll get into that right now also in a little bit. So now, Jesus would spend the next three years with his disciples, teaching them, training them, you know, being with them every day, preparing them for the work of the kingdom. And when those three years were up, they were ready to go and continue the work that Jesus had started. And so, as we're looking at why would Jesus pick over half of them that were fishermen? Is there some kind of hidden thing there? Is there something that he's trying to show us? Well, if we know anything about fishermen, let's look at a few key points about a fisherman. You know, a fisherman is somebody who's not afraid of hard work. Why is that? Well, don't think that a fisherman is, uh, in, in the days that Jesus was out picking fishermen, not like the fishermen that you see on, you know, on some of these shows that you see about them out there on their boats catching fish, right? Because a fisherman in the days of Jesus didn't have all the modern technology to go out there and fish. Everything was done what? 
manually. Everything was done, I guess you could say, old school, right? They didn't have all the technology that make things easier. Everything was done with basic stuff, right? Basic stuff. They didn't have motorized boats to take them out there in the ocean, right? How do you think they got out there in the water? Do you think they, uh, uh, you know, had a, the boat picked them up and, you know, and it turned on the motor and it just took them out there where all the fish were? They had to actually work to get the boat out to where they wanted to fish, which meant that, yeah, they had a row out there. There was no motors or modern machinery in these days, right? So they had to work hard just to move the boat from point A to point B. And then prior to going out in the ocean, they had to make sure their nets were ready. Have any of you ever seen the way fishing nets are? I mean, back in these days, everything was done by hand. They had to make sure that everything was right, that there was no holes in the nets, and if there were, they had to fix them, right? So there was a lot of work in preparing the netting to go out there. And then after rowing, then they go out and cast their nets on the side and catch their fish and come back. And um, what would happen next when they came back with all the fish? They had to clean the fish. And that's a lot of work. So these fishermen were used to hard work. Work wasn't something new to them. I'm sure they got up very early, and I'm sure they, they got home very late because it was an all-day thing. So something interesting in that, how Jesus picked fishermen, people that were used to hard work. You know, as we look at Jesus picking his disciples, you know, he just told them, very simply, as we've seen in Matthew 4, and we've also seen in Mark chapter 1, what did he say to them? He said, basically, come follow me. That's basically what he said. He just, very simple, come follow me. You know, and that's what he's still telling us today. He's still telling us today, come follow me. So, as we're looking into this this morning, do we consider ourselves a true disciple of Christ? Are we a fisher of men? What is a fisher of men? A fisher of men is basically somebody who's out there catching what? Other people, right? A soul winner, leading others to Christ. You know, statistics show that the average Christian has never led somebody to the Lord. That's a very high statistic. Uh, how a Christian has never led somebody to the Lord. And why, why is that? There could be a lot of reasons. Some people could say, well, I, I, I'm just trying to learn about the Bible myself. How am I going to teach somebody about the Bible? Others could probably say, well, you know, um, I'm pretty shy. I don't really know how to talk to people, you know, very well because I'm a shy person. You know, others would probably say, well, that's not my job. That's the pastor's job, right? That's the pastor's job to go out there and be a fisher of men, right? But whatever the reason is, I, I, I truly believe that many people are not fishers of men for this reason and this reason alone. And it's because... Many people are living their life from one crisis to another. Right? One crisis to another. Last week it was one thing. This week it's something else. Next week it's going to be even something else. So one crisis after another is what's happening. And so when we are going from one crisis to another, what ends up happening? When we're going from one crisis to another, right? One problem, one situation, one whatever you want to call it, to another. 
what ends up happening is this, is that oftentimes we're so wrapped up with the situation, the crisis, the problem, how can we be a fisher of men? If all we're doing is focusing on our stuff and our mess. And so, who likes us to be in crisis? Satan does. Because when you're in crisis, really, if you're not rooted and grounded in the Word of God and being able to overcome those crises and continue on, you're going to be stuck is what's going to be happening. You're going to be stuck in your own mess. And you're not going to be able to be a fisher of men. See, what you need to understand is that when you're going through something, a crisis or a storm, it's a test. Hold your place there. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. See, what the storm represents, when I mention the test, it mentions, or excuse me, when, when the storm comes, what the storm does, how it tests you, it tests how stable you are. That's what the storm's going to do. It's going to test how stable you are. How strong is your foundation? Because when the storm of, of life come, and if you just fall apart immediately, right? What does that say? Your foundation wasn't very strong. Right? Because what does the word show us here in 724? Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. In other words, what is Jesus saying? He's saying it's a smart thing to do that if your foundation is built firm and strong. Why? Because when you build your house on a strong foundation, that means that when the storms come, it's not going to fall down. Amen? How would you like to live in a house that when it rains, your roof caves in? I'm sure it may happen. Maybe the roof needed to be fixed or changed. But none of us would want to live in a house if it rained the roof would cave in, right? Or how about to live in a house and, uh, you know, a little breeze might start blowing and your, ho your house blows down. How would you like to live in a house like that? No, you wouldn't. You want a house that's going to protect you from the elements. Why do we live in houses? To protect us from the elements, amen? So now, we're talking about crisis we're talking about storms and what ends up happening is that if we are not being a true disciple of the Lord learning and growing be, when the storms come we will fall apart we're not going to know what to do because see as a as a Christian, as a disciple of the Lord, we're not going to be, we're not exempt from problems. We're not exempt from things happening. But the difference between somebody who is prepared and somebody who's not prepared for the storms is going to determine the outcome. So in other words, when the storms come, when crisis comes, and if you're not prepared, you're not going to be able to handle it, and you're going to fall apart. If you're prepared, if you're ready for the storm, you, you did your due diligence in preparing for the storm, just like those people who prepare for storms along the coast, right? 
When the storm comes, you're ready for whatever it has to throw at you. And you're going to be able to endure as the storm comes. And when the storm is over, you're going to be in good condition. You're going to be okay. You're not going to be there left licking your wounds. Because why? Because you were prepared. And that's why we go through storms, because they're tests to prepare where we are. You know, problems in life are, are going to be there forever. They're, they're constantly going to be there. They're going to come and they're going to go. So we have to understand that and we have to be prepared. Jesus tells us it's the wise man here in verse 27 that it's the wise man who builds his house on the rock. But look at what he says in verse 26. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. That's not very smart to build your house on a foundation that's not firm. That's what Jesus is saying. In other words, what he's telling us is that it's foolish to think that you're going to end up withering the storm when the crisis and when the problems come if you're not rooted and you're not grounded in the Word of God. It's foolish to think so. See, because what you need to understand is this. You can have all the faith in the world. You could say, well, brother, you just don't know how big my faith is. Okay? But... What does the Lord tell us about faith? The Lord, the Lord also tells us that faith without works is dead. So how are you exercising your faith? How are you putting your faith into action? See, if you're sitting around doing nothing, that's not putting your faith into action. It's when you start to exercise your faith and put it into action. Well, what are you saying, brother? Well, what I'm saying is this. You've got to start believing for the impossible. You've got to start believing for the unattainable. You've got to start believing for the miraculous. See, because if you don't exercise your faith, it's not going to get you anywhere. Faith without works is dead, says the Word of God. Faith without works is dead. You have to put it into action. There's, it's more than just believing in what you can't see. You have to put it into action. You've got to start exercising that faith. Believing for the impossible. Believing for healing after the doctor's given you that negative report. Believing and putting it into action. You can't be... Walking around saying, yeah, well, the doctor says uh, it don't look good for me. You can't be walking around speaking negative. You've got to say, you know, yeah, the doctor gave me a bad report. But the Word of God says, by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. And you've got to walk around confident and believing that. Amen? God is good. And this morning, as we're talking right now about crisis, crisis is a big thing because it keeps many of us from going on to that next level in our stage of development of discipleship. Because Jesus wants us to be a fisher of men. He wants us to reach other people. And what you need to understand is, there's many ways to reach other people, but it all comes back to the same thing. Letting them know about the goodness of God. He wants us to reach other people to let them know about the goodness of of God because right now there's a lot of people out there that don't know about the goodness of God they actually think that that you know God you know wants to rain on their parade that God wants doesn't want them to have any fun that you know God is all about rules he wants to tell you what to do and what not to do and he wants to control you. This is their understanding of our God. 
How are these people going to understand that our God is so good? That He gives us the opportunity, He gives us free will to choose as we want to, to either serve Him or not serve Him. That's how much He loves us. How are they going to know about the goodness of God? That His mercies are new every day. How are they going to know about that kind of God that we serve unless we go tell them? So that is why it's so important to move on in our development of discipleship to stop just thinking about our, ourselves and our own walk with God and where we stand with God. Now don't get me wrong. If you're a baby Christian, right? What's a baby Christian? Somebody who's still learning and growing in the things of God. It's all new to them. They're new at it, right? Just like a little baby. Can a baby eat solid food? No, they need, they need milk. They need the bottle. They can't eat solid food. They're not ready yet. So a baby is developing and learning and growing. Well, the same thing happens in our walk with God. We have stages. And when we come to God and we're a new Christian, we're baby Christians. This is all new to us. We're, we're still learning. But don't stay a baby forever. Don't stay making the same mistakes forever. What would you think if you've seen the little, you know, baby, now he's 15 years old walking around with a diaper and a bottle? What would you say? What would you, yeah, exactly, right? We got Christians like that. We got Christians like that. And that's why we don't want to stay where we're at in our walk with God. We got to start growing because God has plans. And if we don't grow, we're going to be stuck. And that's why those crises in our life usually beat us up. They beat us up pretty bad. You got to get to the place where it doesn't matter what the forces of hell can throw at you, that you know, that you know, that you know, that you're going to be okay because God is on your side. Amen? You've got to know that you know that you know that it does not matter what Satan or any of his cohorts, cohorts want to do or try to do with you. They, they can come, the, the whole, all the forces of hell can come against you and you know God is on your side. That you put your trust in Him. And you stand on what the Word says like Psalm 91. You know that you don't have to be afraid of the terror that comes by night. A thousand may fall at your left hand and ten thousand at your right hand. But no plague will come near your dwelling. You've got to know that you know that you know that Almighty God is protecting you. Amen? And so this morning we're talking about discipleship. Jesus wants to make you a fisher of men. But if you stay stuck in your crisis and in your mess, how can you be a fisher of men? How can you tell others about the goodness of God when your stuff is just so overwhelming, your crisis, your, your life is just beating you down. That's why you got to start growing in the things of God. You got to start living for Him in a different way. Amen? You got to start living for Him in a different way. We serve a good God. Amen? You know, what's interesting is Isaiah knew something back in the day. Let's go to the book of Isaiah. I'm going to share a scripture with you from the book of Isaiah. And I believe it's going to be chapter 54. Isaiah 54. Old Testament. So this was before... B.C., before Christ, right? Isaiah was a prophet. A 
man of God who spoke on behalf of God. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 13. Isaiah, here we're going to see, he's talking about discipleship before that word was even coined in the New Testament. Isaiah 54, 13. All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. Parents, you need to stand on that word for your children. I don't care if they're grown adults or still little, stand on that word for your children. And you declare and you confess and say that all my children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of my children. You got to confess it. That's putting your faith into action. Because, see, if uh, little Johnny is not acting like a, somebody who's taught of the Lord right now, that's okay. You got to start confessing these things. Put your faith into action. All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. That's discipleship right there. Learning about the things of God. Amen? We serve a good God. And He wants us to go to that next stage in our discipleship. He wants us to be fishers of men. He doesn't want us staying in the same place. Let's go back to the book of Matthew chapter 4. And we're going to go here to verse 21. Matthew chapter 4, verse 21. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. He called them. And immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. It was Jesus. They went and followed him. Nothing can be more important in our lives than following Jesus. That's a true disciple. Nothing can be more important than following Jesus. That's true discipleship right there. Nothing. Do you want change in your life? Do you want to stop being stuck in crisis? Become a true disciple of Christ. Become a true disciple of Christ. Because that's when you'll start to see the change. Because you're going to start growing. You're not going to be staying stuck where you're at. Amen? Let's go to the, uh, the book of Psalms, chapter 55. Psalms 55. And we're going to verse 22. Psalm 55, verse 22. Cast your burden on the Lord, and He shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. You see that? He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. He's talking about you. All those who are in Christ Jesus are the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen? So if you're the righteousness of God, why are you being moved? Why? you got to do some soul searching. Are you casting your burdens on the Lord? Are you letting Him sustain you? Or are you trying to work everything out yourself? See, God tells us that He will get us through. He tells us here in His Word that He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. That's a promise. Amen? And I want to encourage you this morning to know that God will be with you every step of the way. 
But you've got to do your part. See, God will always do His part. But you have to do yours. Stop setting yourself up for failure. Don't think that you can do your own thing and still continue to benefit in the things of God. Now, don't get me wrong. We serve a good God. He's merciful. The Bible does say His mercies are new every morning. But you also need to understand there's consequences for our actions. So you can't stay on the fence forever and not start to deal with some of these consequences of your actions. You have to get to the place where you finally say, you know what, Lord? I'm done doing it my way. I want to do it your way. I'm going to give it 100%. I'm going to follow you to the best of my ability. I want to be that disciple taught of the Lord. I want to be that fisherman that you're talking about, that fisher of men. That's going to happen when you surrender 100% to God. Not just on Sunday mornings, but every day of the week. Because if you continue to do things your way, I'm here to tell you, nothing's going to change. Crisis to crisis to crisis to crisis. That's what it's going to continue to be like. And you're going to keep getting beat up and beat up and beat up. And you're going to be continuing to lick your wounds and lick your wounds and lick your wounds. And it's not going to change. But when you really are desiring to follow after the things of God, that's when you're going to see the change. That's when you're going to start seeing change in your life. I want to encourage you this morning. Be a true disciple. Being a true disciple means following Christ and putting Him first, just like we've seen in Matthew. They left everything. Nothing was more important than going to follow Jesus. Nothing. And I want to encourage you this morning, think about that. God has a plan for you. He's calling you. Shared with the men yesterday about Jeremiah. You know, you read the book of Jeremiah and you learn that God called him at a young age. God had a calling on his life. God even told him that before he put him in his mother's womb, he was thinking about him. That before he created the foundations of the world, he had a plan for him. And what, Jeremiah? Did you think he said, okay, Lord, let's do this. Let's go conquer the world. No, Jeremiah was hesitant, just like some of you are. Jeremiah had excuses, just like some of you have excuses. His excuse was, but I'm young. And God told him, don't worry about that. Don't, don't worry about that you're too young. Some of you may think you're too old. Don't worry about that. God has a plan for you. And no excuse that we can give Him is good enough. Because He tells us that He's got a plan for us and He wants to use us. All you have to do is be willing. That is it. God needs some true disciples today. He needs some true disciples today. Because why? Because there's many people out there that need to hear about His goodness. And if you're not going to go out and tell them about His goodness, who is? You know, there's people in your lives that only you can reach. There's people that run in your circles that if I were to call them on the phone and say, Hey guy, this is uh, Pastor so-and-so. Uh, why don't you come to church today? I click. It wouldn't even, give me a, wouldn't even give me a second thought. But because you're in different standing with them, and you tell them, hey, you come to church with me. 
you may get a, I'll think about it. You may get a no, but how do you know if you don't ask? If you don't extend the invitation, how will you ever know? Let's be fishers of men. Amen? You're not alone. God will be with you every step of the way. It's time to move on into a new level of discipleship. Let's start growing. Amen? God wants to use you. He's got big plans. But only you can answer that call. Amen? Only you can answer that call. If I can ask everyone to stand this morning as we get ready to close. You know, we serve a good God. And I want you guys to chew on this this week. Ask yourself, am I a true disciple of Christ? Is Christ the most important person in my life? Am I willing to walk away from everything and everyone for Him? Just like the twelve did when He went to call them. They actually stopped what they were doing and just went and followed Him. Am I willing to do that? Ask yourself, am I a true follower of Christ? He gave everything for you. He gave everything for you. He belittled himself. Think about it. God Almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth, belittled himself, came to this earth, for one reason and one reason only. For you. To die for you. To give you a fresh start. So that you can have an eternal life. So that you can have a future. He's looking for some disciples this morning. If I can ask everyone to bow their heads and close their eyes oh father God we lift you up this morning father I pray this morning father that your word was planted on good ground Lord I pray father that your people receive this word father that they received it on good ground father oh father we lift you up this morning father we pray that we would become those disciples that would follow after you and not put anything else before you. Father, we pray that we would be willing to walk away from everything and anyone for you, Lord. Father, we pray that nothing or no one would ever come before you, Lord. Oh, Father, we pray this morning, Father, that we be true disciples. Oh, Father, we give you glory and we give you honor, Father. We thank you for your goodness. And, Father, I speak blessings on your people, Lord. Father, I pray that you would show them your goodness, Father. Show them your goodness in ways they've not seen before. Father, I pray that you would open those doors of opportunity. And, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would help them and teach them to be doers of the word and not just hearers only. Oh, Father, we thank you this morning as we give you glory and we give you honor in the precious name of Jesus. And everyone says, Amen, Amen. I can ask